Hey guys, and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Natasha Martinez, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news in the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us today is Dennis Zen. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another brand new episode of Collider Movie Talk. It's Friday. It's also June 2nd. It's also Wonder Woman Day. Whee! Yeah. Wonder Woo! Woman gets released. Uh, we have a non-spoilers review that's been up for since, I think, Monday night. Mm. And then we had a brand new spoilers review with John Schnepp, Perry Nemiroff, and Christian Harloff that went up this morning. So if you guys want to, if you guys have already seen the movie and want to check that out, that's up now. Hey, also joining us, Perry Nemiroff. Why didn't you say it's National Donut Day? Uh, <laughs> Why don't we have donuts on this table right now? Wow. I think someone dropped the ball. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I don't know who I'm looking at, but I want a donut. Wow. <laughs> I completely agree with you, Perry. We need donuts. Also joining us, John Roca. Hey, C Cody, put up the spoiler alert. This mo Wonder Woman is fantastic. Oh, Wonder boy. Woman is amazing. <laughs> One of the best movies I've ever seen. It's going to tear up the summer box office. That's all I can tell you. And I'm happy to be here. It's not, not really a spoiler. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm just letting you know it's good. Okay. That's the spoiler. Uh, I, I saw it before you, so it didn't spoil anything for me. Okay. <laughs> well, not everyone is as okay. cool as you, Dennis. <laughs> Dennis. <laughs> okay, also joining us, Mark Ellis. Uh, let's go ahead and put that spoiler word back up for a minute. Um, look, guys, donuts have a fat content that is just up to the moon, okay? They're sugary, they're bad for you, that can cause obesity, they cause a lot of bad things. You can take it away now. God, I love donuts, though. They're so good. <laughs> Spoilies. All right, let's get into the first story. The X-Men spinoff New Mutants has found another couple mutants to add to their roster. Thanks to Deadline, we know that 13 Reasons Why star Henry Zaga has signed on for the new movie as Sunspot, while THR is reporting that Stranger Things' Charlie Heaton is in talks to play Cannonball. The movie, now described as a horror thriller, has already cast Macy Williams as Ron Sinclair, a.k.a. Wolfsbane, and Anya Taylor-Joy as Ileana Rasputin, a.k.a. Magic. Fault in Our Stars director Josh Boone is helming the movie while also co-writing the screenplay with his writing partner Nate, Nate Lee. Filming is set to begin in Boston this July with the movie set to hit theaters on April 13th, 2018. Dennis, what are your thoughts on the casting of Sunspot and Cannonball? No, it's good news for uh, people that are on Netflix shows. It's kind of similar to uh, <laughs> earlier on where where HBO used to have like a, a bunch of shows that, that, that movies, uh, studios would pluck certain actors that, that, that would stand out and starting to happen a lot with Netflix. You have uh, Millie Bobby Brown that's mm. going to be in Godzilla. You have, I forgot the name of the actor that's going to be in It that is also right. from Stranger uh, Things. Right. Yeah, so you're having a lot of that. In terms of like the, the characters, Cannonball and Sunspot, Sunspot we saw in Days of Future Past briefly for a few scenes. I like Sunspot. I like his powers cannonball on the hand when when i personally read new mutants which was kind of at the end of the run with rob life rob liefeld i didn't care for him i didn't like the look of him he, he had those stupid goggles he had that that flight suit and he flew around just didn't didn't care for much for him but <laughs> he needs the goggles then. Well, yeah he's yeah. flying at super speed uh -huh. he's got a force field around him i would use some sort of eye protective okay. equipment sure okay. those birds hurt <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah. I got beaked again. Yeah. I gotta get goggles. I gotta get goggles. Uh, but as far as the actor, I, I do like Charlie Heaton. He wasn't like the standout in Stranger Things, but I thought he did, did a good job. As far as Henry Zaga, I, I, I'm getting my way through 13 Reasons Why, mm. and I'm about a little more than halfway. I don't think his character has appeared. If he has, it's very in the background so far, so... I can't j judge his uh, acting. Ellis, what do you think about uh, this? Yeah, I, I liked Henry Zaga from what I saw from him in 13 Reasons Why. And Charlie Heaton, I thought, was one of the better uh, members of the Stranger Things cast. I'm still waiting for him to play the role he was born to play, which is the biopic of Dave Perner, Soul Asylum lead singer. <laughs> oh boy. Until we get that, I'm very excited, whoever got that, uh, <laughs> about Sunspot and Cannonball S being sadly I did. added to the cast. The Soul Asylum kicks ass, man. They're more than just Runaway Train, okay? Um, um, Cannonball, I, I thought, was such a cool character that I do enjoy his power in Sunspot also. Having a, a character who is Latino who is played by somebody who I, I, I believe he's from Brazil, originally yeah. is Henry he's Henry Zaga. Brazil, yeah. So I, I think that's really good news. I like the diversity of this New Mutants mm -hmm. cast. And look, we don't know if, if they're going to position this New Mutants to take the place of X-Men at the box office and make us fall in love with these new characters because that's going to be a very tough thing to do, but if we get them, even as a complimentary piece to a new X-Men crop that we eventually get, I think this is an exciting development for Fox. Perry? 
Yeah, I am really hyped about this whole project. And whether he wears goggles or not, I don't care any little <laughs> detail about this film just because this package is coming together so damn well. I've yet to finish 13 Reasons Why. I actually have yet to finish the first episode. I know I have to give it a chance. I know, I know. I know a lot of people like I've it. I've yet to finish it. it you haven't finished the first it episode. Got, it was like a little too, I it's don't know. Heavy, like, it's like heavy, It's heavy. teen drama-y it's for me. Angsty. So I don't yeah. know. And I also didn't really give it a fair shot. So I'll watch it eventually. So I don't know about Henry Zaga, but... The fact that you are potentially casting Charlie Heaton, who I did really think stood out in Stranger Things, mm. Maisie Williams and Anya Taylor-Joy, you don't cast three great actors like that and not have a fourth great actor to join them. So I think the three of them speak for his ability enough for me right now. And then Josh Boone, everything he says about this project just gets me so excited. Yeah. I think we were talking about it on an earlier episode this week in Movie Talk, the whole thing with horror. Oh, and also the, the costume. Apparently you don't have to worry about the costume because the quote was, uh, there, are, there are no costumes. Yeah. I don't know if he meant that literally where there are no costumes. But you but the, still, goggles are not a costume, Perry. They're, they're oh, necessary. Because they're, they're, they're functional? Eyewear, yeah. It's like you don't, you don't whole, mess with Bunsen burners without is, protective eyewear. You don't fly at supersonic speeds. This the whole is, costume is, is did you technically a, did you accept functional. A, did you accept a sponsorship from a, Google, a, go, a goggles company? Like, what's going on? I'm wearing here? a Speedo right now. <laughs> I, wore, <laughs> I wore sports goggles as a kid. Yeah. Um, I'll bring those in. How Rex do you feel Bex. about that? Yeah, yeah. Rex Bex, seriously, oh with gosh. a little blue nose piece that would leave a mark on your face and all week. Female Kurt Rambis. So glad we're talking about uh, uh, New Mutants right now. Mm, yes. Uh. <laughs> Rook, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, Rook, Rook are, are you a fan of this casting? Yeah. And were you a fan of those characters? Uh, well, yeah, I am a fan of the characters. I do like Sunspot. And Cannonball is interesting because Cannonball has an interesting history as a character because he started out kind of evil with the Hellfire Club, and then he didn't kill... Some of the new mutants, and Charles saw this and brought him onto the team. Plus, he's got a bunch of siblings who are mutants that are part of through the X-Men universe as well. So Cannibal is a very interesting, unique character. Now, have they used him correctly all the time? No, but he's one of these people that's gone from the Hellfire Club to New Mutants to the actual X-Men roster and back down in X-Force as well. And this is what's interesting, too, is Cannibal and Sunspot have both factored into the X-Force storyline. So we see this becoming a possibility in a shared universe, possibly all this stuff roaming around. So I like this. And Henry Zaga, I know people talk about 13 Reasons Why. I liked him on Teen Wolf. If you haven't seen Teen Wolf, it's one of these really underappreciated MTV shows. And I really hated when MTV went to shows. So I didn't really give a lot of them a chance. And I thought, and I was surprised by Teen Wolf because a friend of mine was in it. And so I decided to watch it. And actually, he was really good in it. And he did this funny little drag uh, film that I saw with a friend of mine. Yes, I have gay friends. Nothing wrong with that. It's called Cherry Pop. And it was a really funny little drag film that I enjoyed him in as well. But this guy who's playing Cannonball, I actually loved him on, on Stranger Things. I thought he was really essential to that show. You know, because he had the whole Steve thing. But you always got to have that angsty, broody kid from high school. Everyone's <laughs> got one of those guys that they knew or knew about in high school. And I think he's perfect for Cannonball because Cannonball has that kind of angsty, which side am I on type mm -hmm. thing. And he did that through Stranger Things. So this is really just, this is like... Uh, uh, Perfect casting. It just works so well. So I like that they're all involved in this, and I like that it just pushes this idea of the horror uh, aspect as well. Okay. All right, guys. Now we're moving on to by ourselves. Natasha, what do we got first? Variety reports that Silicon Valley star Thomas Middleditch has joined legendary and Warner Brothers Godzilla King of Monsters. He joins Stranger Things, Millie Bobby Brown, Kyle Chandler, Vera Farmiga, and O'Shea Jackson Jr. Krampus and Trick or Treat director Michael Daugherty takes over directing duties from Gareth Edwards from a script he wrote with Zach Shields. Godzilla King of Monsters hits theaters on March 22nd, 2019, with Kong stepping into the ring a year later in Godzilla vs. Kong on May 22nd, 2020. Ellis sell Thomas Middleditch in Godzilla King of Monsters. I'll buy it, Natasha. Uh, Silicon Valley is one of those genius shows on TV right now, and Thomas Middleditch is one of the big reasons why. And I think he's one of these guys who can make that transition not only from TV to film, but also from a comedic role to something that might have some comedic elements, but also is serious. I mean, is anybody doubting that Middleditch is going to be the guy who slowly takes his glasses off <laughs> as he reveals exactly what is happening from a scientific perspective in this movie? He probably is wearing Rex Specs, and then he takes them off to deliver the news to the rest of us peons that there's a huge monster coming to fight Godzilla. So I think that's the role he's going to have, and I think it's good casting. Middleditch, congratulations. Looking forward to seeing him make the leap from Silicon Valley and Verizon commercials <laughs> to Godzilla, King of Monsters. Perry? I buy it only if he's wearing Rex Specs. I, I'll buy anything that he's in, and it actually goes back to what you were saying before about a whole bunch of stars from Netflix shows moving mm. on to do bigger things. I mean, really, every single cast member 
pretty much from Silicon Valley is going on to do mm-hmm. something, either something great or something that's that's uh, their own. Uh, Kumail Nanjiani has mm-hmm. The Big Sick coming out, yeah. which is one of my most anticipated movies of the summer. I can't wait to see that. And I'm excited to see Middle Dutch get a big role in something like this. And you guys know he was in, because when I was looking this up, and I realized it's true, he was in uh, Kong Skull Island. Mm-hmm. He was on the phone. Yes. And then I, I rewatched that scene. and Was he really? Yep. Yeah. I mean, you, you really would never know, and I don't think it would make any sense for him to reprise that role in this movie, but... It's it's a curious connection there. I think he because he's friends with the director of Kong Skull Island because I, I, and that's the role they gave him. It was literally just it's a phone conversation between him and Brie Larson when she's in the dark room mm-hmm. and he's basically the person that tells her you have to be here at this time to get on the boat. It seems like that's an important person, but then again, it would make absolutely no sense if he came back for this movie. His skin looks fantastic. He is aging remarkably because yeah, this yeah, is really. going to take place like. Well, in modern day. Yeah. yeah, so it would it would make no sense unless they, I, I don't know, aged him up way too much. But but still, this this is another thing. It's like uh, what we were talking about with New Mutants. This is a cast that is just coming together insanely well. Millie Bobby Brown, Kyler Chandler, Vera Farmiga, Charles Dan, Sally Hawkins, and Michael Dougherty. Still mm-hmm. another reason, and I'm going to keep saying it until the day this movie comes out. I am rooting for him. I'm a big Dowdy fan. Trick or Treat's one of my favorite movies, probably of all time, and I think Krampus deserves a little more credit than it's gotten, so I really want to see him do a big movie like this. Hmm. Roka? Yeah, I, I love this idea, too. I think I echo what, uh, what Mark and uh, Perry have been saying about Thomas Middleditch. He's just great. He's been going... It's, he's been working since 2009, building his resume, building his credibility as a writer as well, doing all sides. You've seen him in College Humor. You've seen him in all these kind of things. He's did. It, I think he did it the right way, and now seeing him as a lead in Silicon Valley, which is one of those shows like you start Silicon Valley and the first two or three episodes you're like why am I still watching this show and then it kicks in uh. and it's fantastic at least from my opinion <laughs> and then I really go on the ro- go on the train all the way to the end and I think Middle Ditch is one of the reasons because they're always messing with him and he can get so irritating in this role as this character but he's also endearing which is why you stick with it you know and so I think that's a, a, a really rare combination to find when you're playing these kinds of characters so yes obviously this makes sense I think he's going to be the comic relief like John C. Riley was yeah. in Kong Skull Island it makes sense and speaking of yeah he's Credited as Jerry. That's Jerry. his name in the film, Jerry. So on the phone. So maybe Jerry, like maybe his he plays his son, Jerry's son, if we're gonna do it like, you know, you, so you never know. There's all kinds of ways to play hey, with it. My dad made a phone call to you. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> you know, my dad was coordinating that, that Kong Skull Island trip. When I when I saw this, my initial reaction was was Charlie Day's casting in Pacific Rim, yeah, your yeah. movie. And it's like Oof. I think that Charlie Day could have been better utilized in there, but I understand what they were going for, yeah. that character. Hopefully it pays off. Off a little bit better with Middle Ditch in Godzilla King of Monsters. Yeah, I'm going to buy it for the same reasons. I, I love Silicon Valley. It's my favorite comedy on television right now, especially now that Curb Your Enthusiasm is still waiting for that new season oh, yeah. to, to launch. But uh, unlike Roca, I, I love that Silicon Valley right from the start. Yeah. It just gotcha. keeps getting better and better, and he's a, a big reason why. Um, yeah, I, I do see him playing that kind of role because you already have uh, Millie Bobby Brown, you have Kyle mm-hmm. Chandler, you have mm-hmm. O'Shea Jackson, who else you have? Vera for me. I think they're all going to play like serious characters and he, he's going to be the comedic relief. But I like to see, he's a, I, I mentioned before, Netflix actors, he's an HBO actor. Mm-hmm. They, they, they're plucking them all from from those type of type of series and I, I'm happy that he's in it. You ever see The Final Girls? That's no. another one. He's so good mm. in it. Ha, have none of you ever seen that? The no. only reason I'm bringing it up is because obviously we're talking about Middle Ditch, but someone tweeted me about that recently. No? Apparently Never. Cody's seen it. Oh Cody's going God. insane hey. off camera over there. That's what I'm talking okay, about. Wait, if what? you haven't seen The Final Girls, you need to. it's like a, an 80s horror spoof film. Riley, oh. please help me. Thank you. Okay, go right. see that movie. Oh, man. <laughs> Exciting show happening off camera. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's next? The internet collapsed on itself recently when people on Google discovered that the runtime found in the search results for Transformers the last night was listed at three hours and two minutes. The Lawrence of Arabia of giant robot movies comes out in three weeks on June 21st. And to assure fans that they wouldn't have to schedule in three bathroom breaks, director Michael Bay took to Twitter to calm the masses by debunking the Google search. He said on Twitter, reports of Transformers the last night being over three hours is wrong. It's shorter than the last three movies by a lot. Roca, since Bay says the movie will be shorter than the last three, buy or sell the last night's runtime under two hours and 30 minutes. Well, first, before I buy or sell anything, 
I know who writes the notes for these things. Oh, and he should just put at the end, hashtag shade. He just should say that, throwing shade. Because I see the Lawrence of Arabia, the, the, the snooty little comments. I get it. I get it, Mark Riley. Saucy. Current cha- quote-unquote champ, as Steph Curry might say. Listen, listen, <laughs> Transformers, the last night should be three hours and two minutes. I was actually excited when they said three hours and two minutes. I was like, oh, this means I can have a couple of stouts while I'm watching this movie. This is awesome at the Arclight. But unfortunately, he's, uh, Michael Bay is saying it's going to be less time. I, I don't know. I have a tough time buying what Michael Bay says because he'll say one thing and they'll like, he'll like kind of finagle it or play, with the, play within the, you know, like mess around with the, with the holes in his statement a little bit. And so I think it will be less time. It's probably because they think this is going to make a crap ton of money. So you want to have as many screenings of it as possible. I mean, the last one made one and a half billion dollars. That's not anything to sneeze at. So for one installment, not as a franchise, for one installment. So I think they want to have as many uh, screenings of this film as possible. And also I think he understands the backlash and the studio probably does too they don't want to make it so so uh long that people are like i'm not going for three hours and two minutes plus prices are rising on films so it's like people don't want to necessarily spend as much if they're not gonna if they're gonna uh, not enjoy the experience fully and be in there for three hours and two minutes plus trailers plus credits because there's gonna so, be so you're selling this thing i'm so, yeah i'm selling that it's gonna that it's gonna be shorter shorter yeah i think okay. he's gonna be two hours and 45 i really okay. do um, uh, everyone knows what I think about the movie franchise, even though I, it's a beloved uh, t- television cartoon and toy series for me when I was growing up. But I actually buy this. I buy this a lot because, look, there's many problems with the Transformers movie franchise, and one of them is the length. I mean, you're sitting in there, and it's not moving. The story's not moving. And, like, you're not feeling a lot of the stuff. And then they instead, they just make it even longer I mean, what was how long was the last? Two hours and forty-five minutes. Yeah, Jesus Christ! But that would made up one and a half billion dollars. Yeah, but (laughs) the only reason they do that is because Michael Bay wants it that long. The studio doesn't want it that long. Um, And I'm actually glad that hopefully, if he's telling the truth, that that he sees. Oh, look, people don't actually want it to be longer. Mm. That that people actually want it to be shorter, and it's, it's something. Maybe a mistake that he realizes. So I actually applaud him for that. Ellis? Look, Dennis, I want to make this clear. Roka's good at some stuff, okay? Um, I just think he's totally way off base here with everything he said about Transformers. Right from the start, when you say you're bringing a stout beer to a... Transformers, the last night, is not a stout kind of movie. What? It's a case of Natty Light at best. You bring it in there and you start chugging, and hopefully you stop chugging after two hours because these movies do not need to be longer than two hours. And it doesn't make sense from a film story standpoint, first of all, but also from a marketing standpoint or a studio viewpoint because you want less runtime so you can have more showings of these movies. Yes. Age of Extinction made one and a half billion dollars worldwide. It might break two if you make it shorter and you allow for more playings of these stupid movies. Now, I think that the last night, when I saw that the runtime was going to be three hours, my first thought was actually something positive, where I'm like, sweet, we're going to spend a lot of time in the Arthurian medieval mm. look. Maybe we get some, some solid World War II stuff in there. Then we get to the future, the present, wherever the hell we're going from here. But then I was also like, yeah, three hours. If the movie starts going bad, like Age of Extinction started going bad, it is just such a, you're just squirming in your seat for the last hour and a half. And I just don't want to deal with that again, Dennis. I don't want to be (laughs) waiting there and trying to time my pee break against when the Dinobots show up. Like they they waited to reveal them at like hour 230 or whatever for Age of Extinction. So I want to see Transformers. I want to see what you can give me in two hours. And I want to see a lot of King Arthur. You're a crotchety old man. <laughs> <laughs> You're a crotchety old man. Yeah. I, I like me a beer during a movie, <laughs> right. but I don't like to drink a whole lot of beer in a movie that makes me feel like someone's <laughs> shaking my head for three hours. Oh. That that does not mix very well. So I will not be having any beer during any Transformers movie, no matter <laughs> how long it is. Um, I'm going to believe Michael Bay, though, because I think it's a I think it would be a little bit of an extreme thing to actually flat out lie like that on Twitter, because everyone at every single website now has a screenshot of that tweet. If that movie comes out and it is, in fact, longer than all the other movies, oh. he's going to he's going to get a good deal of shit for that. And, you know, I, I wouldn't mind a two hour Transformers movie because. 
I've told you this before. I don't I don't like the last three Transformers movies. I really like that first one, mm-hmm. but just because I don't like that those last three does not mean I'm going into this one thinking, like, I can't wait to hate on this. This mm. is going to be god-awful. I want it to be bad. I want it to be good. Sure. But I will say that if it came to light that the runtime of the movie was really three hours, I, w- I don't think I'd be able to hold that hope and positivity together mm. the same way because whether it's a Transformers movie or an, or an Oscar movie, anything, we'll talk about this more later too, it is very difficult to justify a three-hour runtime. So I, I'm buying this because I really hope it's true. It's difficult because, I mean, by a lot. He means by a lot. So if he, we're talking a two-hour movie. Thank- well, I, I, okay, and so because it seems like an ex- the, from the so trailers, he's, it's expansive. All these decades and periods. Plus, if we're going out to the origin planet of the Transformers, that's a lot that you're talking about to shove all that into two hours. I think is going to be really, well. You really have, tough. I, I think Age of Extinction was what two forty. Age and, of Extinction yeah. was two forty five, and the shortest of the series was the first one, yeah. which is two hours and twenty three. But minutes. he said if the last two Dark of the Moon was two thirty seven. I think two thirty four. So if, if this movie is like if this movie's two fifteen. That's a good, that, 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 that's a good number for me. Two but is fifteen hours, minutes a lot? Huh? Is fifteen minutes a lot? <laughs> it, it's about. So, sh- look, look. When you're being tortured, it's a lot, right? So <laughs> when you go from three Same hours to two hours. Oh, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and also, Ellis, you don't have to stay for the whole movie. You I can probably, leave. Uh, well, They've well, got your well, money already. You can leave. Yeah, they, but they, he's got to review it. Oh, no, that's true. Review yeah, that's that's, true. that's a Transformers thing. pull quote right there. <laughs> you can leave. <laughs> this is the, something you can actually do. Most put it right on the poster. <laughs> if you go to a movie and you're having like a, a horrible time and you hate the movie or like somebody's annoying you in the theater, I think within the first 45 <laughs> minutes, most theaters will give you your money yes, back. Yes, true. Now that's like one tenth of a Transformers running time. But if you find out in the first 45 minutes that this is just like every other Transformers movie, you can go and get your money back. Just to put it out there. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the next one. Universal Pictures has unveiled a new extended clip for the upcoming Charlize Theron action movie, Atomic Blonde. Directed by John Wick, co-director and future Deadpool Helmer, David Leach, the movie finds Theron in a lethal MI6 assa- as a lethal MI6 assassin who is sent to Berlin to deliver a dossier, only to become caught up in a web of espionage and intrigue. The film also stars Sofia Boutella, James McAvoy, John Goodman, Eddie Marson, and Toby Jones. Atomic Blonde opens in theaters on July 28th. Perry Byer sell the new clip from Atomic Blonde. Bye, and you guys all better buy this too. Uh, this, I'm so excited for this. This is yet another one that is one of my most anticipated of the summer. I th- I'm pretty sure I have the most anticipated every single weekend of this summer, which is actually kind of cool. But everything I've seen from this movie, I absolutely love. And clearly Charlize Theron is capable of doing all this action. We know from Mad Max recently. And then when you watch this clip, so this, this clip is super cool because I love how they work in the music. It's got a great beat to it. I think it's shot very well. But with her ability as an action star, you have that one longer take where it's her in the middle of two guys and then the other guy that comes across the table. There's no cutting there. There's no stunt double there. That is her sell- her just completely selling on her own a, a number of very physical stunts. So I think she is going to crush it in this movie. And I also just really like the way that uh, the director shot all this. I love at the very beginning how you have uh, the use of all the mirrors and mm. what that does. It kind of, it does really enhance the action. It makes it a little more exciting. And it also just, it shows that this movie is going to have a unique visual style. The only thing that kind of got a little stuck in my mind, and I, I know what's going to get brought up now because we talk about color palette with DC movies every once in a while, but this clip, it might have just been the uh, the YouTube, but it, lo- it looked a little a little gray, a little color less. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes contrast is nice. So I hope there's a little more contrast in the feature film. But that's the only thing. Roga. Oh, yeah, I totally buy it. I, you know, Perry, you don't have to threaten me. I absolutely buy it. I enjoyed, <laughs> I enjoyed the clip so much. I'm looking forward to this as well. I've been a, a massive fan of Charlize since the beginning, since like two days in the valley. Like, I, I thought she was great in that Reindeer Games. Like, there's some crappy little films. But she always shined in all these films. And so to see her win the Oscar with Patty Jenkins, with Monster, and all the stuff she's done, Mad Max, but also Eon Flux. Eon Flux is not a good film. She's good in it as an action 
star. So I've been desperate to see her in a vehicle like this for some time, so it's great to see her doing this. And Perry is right, and I put this down in my notes as well. I love that we get full body shots of her doing the fight scenes. That's important to me as a fan of action films. Whenever you do fast cuts or jump cuts, I know that's not the actor or the actress. And when they go on interviews and they go, I did all my own stunts, I did all my own fight scenes, I go, bull crap. Everyone knows that's not true. When you do the cuts, it's because the director looks, looks at the film and sees that you look terrible doing the fight scene. So the fact that Charlize can do these with such fluidity and such power and such strength and isn't like, you can't tell that like she's like slowing, like she's like slowing down. It looks really well done and, and inventive and it's one of the best uses of father figures since Keanu, I guess. Uh, so I like that with the, with the, and one of the best uses of a whip slash rope since Indiana Jones. Like she's so great. I mean, aside from Wonder Woman, obviously, but she's so great at doing this and I love that this is highlighting and I don't mind the color palette at all. I like kind of bluer, hueish things, grayish stuff. The other scenes with Sylvia Boutel in, in the trailer have been red hue. So you're getting this vibe that everything is kind of underground in, a, in like some kind of club or something in your mind when you're watching the whole film. Uh, so to me, I like that. It, it accentuates the grittiness of it for me. Yeah, I buy it as well. Uh, I, I think um, I, I've already seen you know the trailer before. I like that. Mm. My only concern about this is that this clip when you see in the trailer, it's some of my favorite stuff. So I'm mm. hoping that there's more beyond this in terms of the action. We already know David Leach from all the John Wick stuff. This obviously is a, a, a lot like that. So I'm hoping they've saved a lot that we haven't seen in the movie. Mark? Right, yeah, I'll buy it as well because David Leach would probably be the first guy to tell you that you can direct those cool looking scenes only as much as your star will allow you to do, which is why, you know, Keanu Reeves was so great in John Wick, and it looks like Charlize Theron the same way in this movie because she can kick a lot of ass. And I buy the kinetic energy I saw mm -hmm. here, the visual flair. I did like the color palette. I thought it was it was a unique way to tell this little story. I'm not sure if it's going to bother me if it permeates through the two hours or if it's like a Transformers movie, three and a half hours <laughs> running time that we're going to get with Atomic Blonde, but I'm very excited about this. And look out, if you're somebody like me who enjoys wearing black leather jackets, you're somebody like Roca that enjoys full khaki suits because Charlize Theron is coming for you. Hoo is it Theron or Theron? Theron, um, I think. Is it, I'm not Theron. sure. Is it Theron? Is it biopic or biopic? <laughs> <laughs> I remember that conversation. I can still go biopic. I yeah. figured out a way to make it work. All right. All right, what's next? A24 has released the new trailer for It Comes at Night, the much-anticipated horror film from filmmaker Tra Trey Edward Schultz. The movie follows Paul, played by Joel Egerton, who learns that an evil is stalking his family home. As he secures everyone inside while an unnatural threat terrorizes the world, the order Paul has established with his wife and son is put to the test with the arrival of a desperate young family seeking refuge. It Comes at Night opens in theaters on June 9th, 2017. Dennis, buy or sell the new trailer for It Comes at Night. I'm going to sell this trailer. Now, now, before anyone goes into, what? well, Dennis doesn't like horror movies, and Dennis that's why he's... Dennis doesn't like horror yeah, movies. He doesn't, <laughs> I actually am really looking forward to this movie. Uh, I saw the original trailer in front of Get Out, which is another mo horror movie that I quite enjoyed, and I think I'm going to really like this. I love Joel Edgerton. I like the vibe of it. I, like, I don't like this trailer. I don't like the look of, like, look, horror movies, at least for me, I, I like the tension. I like it being very focused on one thing. I didn't like the multiple screens jumping around with the quotes and everything. I, mm. I just thought it was very distracting. I, I want I want the movie to engross me in so that I can feel the tension and fear. This trailer did not do that for okay. me. Huh. Perry, the look on your face. I know, just because, all right, the first teaser trailer that came out is excellent because of what you just said. It gave you exactly what you wanted, where it kind of pulls you into yes. their situation, and it doesn't exactly tell you what's happening, but it makes you wonder, like, what could they be talking about? Why is that red door so important? The second trailer, which I think we talked about on Movie Talk right after I had seen the movie, avoid that second trailer. That trailer is full of, of potential spoilers, and I think it could ruin some of, the, some of the mystery of the movie. This, however, goes back in the other direction. I think this is a really great way to give you a sense of just that, again, like a frenetic energy, just in a being completely out of control. And I thought it was very clever the way that they used quotes from so many different types of people, I, uh, Charles Manson to Aristotle, mm. and how they use one word to connect it to everything. Because the whole point of this movie is exactly what I think one of the last quotes says, is that most of the evil in the world is done by people with good intentions. And that, that's what this movie is about. It's, it's not about whatever, you know, this thing that's happening in the world. It, it's not so much about, you know, like a sci-fi zombie apocalypse type thing. We're not focusing on that. It's about these people 
and what they will do to protect the people they love. And I think this trailer, I think it reflects that. And I think it reflects the fact that, you know, you're looking all around at all the, like, what's going on? What should I watch out for? What should I focus on? I don't know what to do. I just want to protect the people I love. That's that's what it's about. And I think this trailer actually represents that quite well. Mm. Ellis? Uh, I love this trailer. That is the visual representation of every internet comment section. Um, I think that this movie looks so horrifying. I cannot wait to see it on Tuesday. And the trailer, I dug, but it, it did bother. The quote started bothering me, and I think it's because they open with a quote from Charles Manson. Mm -hmm. And so it's almost like they're putting Charles Manson on a plane with <laughs> Sylvia Plath and Aristotle and all these other people. I think it would have been more effective if they could have closed it with a quote from Charles Manson, where you're seeing all, you're seeing like a T.S. Eliot quote, and you're seeing all these people that you, that you know and respect and have read, and then it ends with a Charles Manson quote, like, oh, that's scary. So it just, it had me wondering if we're gonna get other quotes from like, horrible serial killers or psychopaths in here too. So I found myself more looking at the quotes and the actual visuals in the movie, but everything that this trailer included in it from a visual sense scared the hell out of me. I can't wait to see this movie. So it's a buy for me. This trailer did a good job of selling me on the fact that I need to see this movie. Roka? Yeah, I absolutely buy it. I loved it. I think it's a new kind of, like you, look, horror has become like now a really uh, 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 popular genre. Like, a lot of people are doing and producing these kind of smaller independent horror films that really go deeper into the psyche of stuff, deeper into the uh, into the aspects of the horror uh, genre. And I enjoy this stuff when it's done well. And I know I'm seeing a good trailer for a horror movie when I go, nope, nope, no way, nope, <laughs> not putting myself through that. I know, And then I'll go anyway. Like, Paranormal Activity, I had that reaction the first time. I was like, oh, no, 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 no. I'm not doing that. <laughs> and I've seen all four, like, the first four, I saw the first four and then just stopped. Uh, but like, but with this one, I know the first trailer, what Perry said is right, the first trailer scared the living crap out of me when I went to see some film, it was an independent theater, and I told Perry, I wanna go, where's your plus one, because I just wanna experience this. And then the second trailer, they showed last night before Wonder Woman at the Grove, and you're right, there's some spoiler stuff in that trailer you shouldn't see if you wanna enjoy this movie purely, because I like knowing that I don't know what's behind that red door, right? And so with this, this combination of Aristotle and T.S. Eliot and Sylvia Platt and Charles Manson, I never thought I'd see that his combination to promote a film. It's a weird like, foursome on the yeah, golf course. Right, yeah. right, unless I was watching a bad installment of a Bill and Ted series. You know, I, was, <laughs> like, I just didn't think I, I, you know, I would see that. But there it is. But I like the unique approach they're taking to marketing this movie. That is very unique to me. And it, I was like, okay, I give it props and points for its inventiveness because I haven't seen that before to promote a, fil a, a film. And A24 just... I just love everything they're doing. I'm such a massive fan of the way they're promoting these films. And once again, this is ingenuity, this is inventiveness. So that's why I buy it. Okay. All right, let's go on to the last buy or sell. Natasha, what do we got? Sony has released a new trailer for Edgar Wright's Baby Driver. The film stars Antel Elgort as Baby, a getaway driver who suffers from a hearing impairment that requires him to listen to music in order to drown out the humming noise. When he falls for a local waitress, played by Lily James, he sees the chance to break free of his life of crime, but first must make a getaway from crime boss, played by Kevin Spacey. The film opens on June 28th and also stars John Bernthal, Isaac Gonzalez, John Hamm, and Jamie Foxx. Ellis, buy or sell the new trailer for Baby Driver. I'm tempted to sell it at the top just because I didn't need to see any more trailers for Baby Driver, but I'm in that, that rare community where we see every trailer that comes out, and I love the first, I think, two trailers that we got previous to this one for Baby Driver, so I'm already, you, you have my money, I'm excited to see your movie, and this one showed a lot of new things I hadn't seen in those other two trailers, so now I'm like, back off, okay, I get it, it's gonna mm. be a good movie, let's go see it, but for people who may not be aware that there is a movie called Baby Driver coming out with all these stars, this great cast, directed by Edgar Wright, it's a necessary trailer to watch, so I'm gonna give it a buy based on that, I am so excited about this movie, it looks funny, it looks quick, it looks action-packed, it's got everything I wanna see in it. Perry? Guess what else is one of my most anticipated <laughs> <laughs> So pretty much everything except for Transformers The Last Night is on, on your you most anticipated. I think you might be right. <laughs> That's Aww, unfortunate. That's unfortunate. <laughs> um, but no, this is I'm same thing what you just said, Ellis. This is yet another great trailer for a movie that already has my money. I, the only thing that this trailer, I think, does a little differently that was kind of refreshing is it focuses a little more on the heist team rather than mm. the, the Lily James, Ansel mm. Elgort relationship, which I think is fun. It's not that I'm sick of that. It's just it, it is a lot of fun to see them all together. And I forget the actress's name. I like that they highlighted her. Uh, Natasha just read it in the description, and I'm going to be kicking myself for not having written it down. But the, the female... Liza uh, Gonzalez. Yes. Mm -hmm. it, I, she just had like a couple very powerful images where she's standing there with two mm -hmm. machine guns, and it just seems 
seems like that group is going to have a great dynamic. And the way that they, they cut this, I mean, yeah. the way that they cut this trailer, it just goes to show, because a lot of times we talk about trailers that are often cut by like trailer houses or people that are specifically looking at it from from a marketing money standpoint. And this trailer, to me, feels like something that very much will reflect what this movie is because it's very important that the music is diegetic in this movie and we are hearing everything that the main character is hearing and I think this trailer is kind of exemplifying that so I'm I'm just happy that they're really kind of making an effort to have that be part of the marketing campaign. Yeah, this is a big buy for me. I, I love the trailer. I got a little kind of Reservoir Dogs vibe with Kevin Spacey mm. in there in that room, kind of like the he's yeah. like uh, assigning Mr. Pink and Mr. Yep. White all their names. Uh, I love the use of music, the tequila. Uh, this this is Edgar Wright's, I think, biggest movie, right? Because uh, these are like the biggest stars he's ever collected. It's a bigger action piece. I mean, I've, I've liked all his movies. World's End wasn't my favorite of, of the ones that he's done, but he hasn't done a movie yet so far that I haven't liked. Um, also, this comes out the day before my birthday, and I'd like to wash out last year's birthday. Ooh, uh, I, I remember that. that. Don't say it. Don't say it. Resurgence. <laughs> yeah, resurgence. For, 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 it used to be forever, right? And they changed it to resurgence. I, I yeah, forget. poor yeah. Dennis walked in there, uh, a, a young, sprightly 39 year old <laughs> yeah. man. And he walked out with him like the old guy from old, old, the last clip. So hopefully, wow. maybe watching Baby Driver this year on my birthday will like turn back. <laughs> Turn back time. I could turn back. Yeah. Yes. You, you need to stop going with cynical old people, Dennis. Come with me. I'm young and vibrant. Okay. Independence Day Resurgence uh -huh. was a great experience for me and my friends. So I'm just letting you know. I right, listen. This trailer. I'm gonna say something for an international audience, right? Comprar, aquistar, achate, kaimasu, kaufen, gaumai, yaho, kupitz. I buy it in all languages that it comes out in because I absolutely love this trailer. Is that a bunch of so different languages? So damn much. Where yes. You buy stuff? It was Italian, French, Japanese, German, Chinese, and wow, Russian. Wow, your imaginary I'm friends it. are going to be it's so all impressed. All those different languages. Because <laughs> I'm telling you, this is how much I've been looking for. This is the number one film aside from the superhero ten poles that I've been looking forward to from the first trailer. I like this trailer so much because, like Harry said, they highlighted the heist situation, and yeah. then they highlight enough of the romance stuff in the middle, and then they give everybody a certain amount of time to do stuff, which I really enjoy. Joy, what's going on over there? What's going on over there? Oh my gosh! Probably <laughs> giggling. Hit the desk and, anyways, continue. Oh. Okay, there we go. It's yeah, all right. So anyway, I, I just Wait, really say enjoyed those words this. again. No, I'm not. yeah. How much did you pay in Rosetta Stone for this year? <laughs> I said, I'm an educated man, Dave. No, I, I love the tequila. Rook has been around the earth a long time. That's a long time. <laughs> he's, what we, he's traveled. Yeah. He's traveled. The I've walked many he's lifetimes. So let me just remember, remember. <laughs> but I don't the earth know. used to be one piece of land. Right? Pan, we used to call Pan it Pangea. Pangea. Yeah. Or P-Town. We used to call it P-Town. <laughs> anyway. And I love the use of tequila here. Best use since Big Top Pee, or I mean, uh, Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Yeah. So I didn't think you could top that, and it just feels like they topped that in this in this film. And what's great about the trailer is I think this trailer, of all the trailers, encapsulates the experience you're going to have when you go see this film all around. Just the feeling of the the uh, the sweetness of the love story, the kind of real darkness of the robbery stuff, but then the humor as well. And Kevin Spacey gets a little more screen time in this trailer. Like you said, Eliza Gonzalez, you have time for all these different parts of the robbery team to have moments in this trailer so let you know like what the film is going to be like so absolutely but my greatest fear about this is that it becomes scott pilgrim and not what we like we all think it's going to be great and the public doesn't respond to it and it doesn't make any money and that's what i'm really really afraid of because unique experiences like this are are should be celebrated mm -hmm. when you get a chance to go see films like this in the theater and i'm worried that it's going to be like scott pilgrim and people won't come out to see it yeah, I think the, the maybe the cast because it's a little bit more well known will Hopefully. help it out. Yeah. It, and it's a little more stylish, so in, in less sense where where Scott Pilgrim was kind of catering towards the you know you had the kind of comic book slash video, right, video game, game audience. Yeah. This is a little more broader. She's got such I, a tough I think. opening. It's opening against a Will Ferrell, Amy Poehler comedy. Yeah, the, big the same weekend, which yeah. which I hope is funny, but it just it I, I think it's got an uphill climb at the box office. So I think it will settle around <laughs> what Edgar Wright movies tend to do, mm. which is get critically mm. well reviewed, mm -hmm. then end up making maybe thirty, forty million dollars at the domestic yeah. box okay. office. That'd be fun. Yeah. All right, guys, uh, before we get on to mailbag, I remind you that we're going to take your live tour questions at the end. Also, remind you that we have a bunch of shows that have recently come out, like an all brand new episode of Jedi Council 
yesterday. Like I mentioned before, the Wonder Woman spoiler review came up this morning. We also have a brand new Schmodown, which is actually a double header. Uh, Mark, do you want to talk about That's that? That's right. Well, header? what you want to look for in this double header today is Mance and Rudnick. It's like it's it's one of the one of the best <laughs> combinations of energy I've ever seen in my life. Make sure you guys tune into the Schmodown today. You do not want to miss it. And, and there's Bob a little pro, what's it, uh, before the the main event. Uh, Jonathan Voitko versus mm. Stacey, Stacey Howard mm -hmm. as well. That's we, right. We also have another new show that is coming out that we actually starting today, premiering today. Perry, uh, you want to talk a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, so clearly Netflix is a pretty popular thing and a super useful tool right now, but you might have a hard time using it because there's so many movies to pick from. So we thought that we would make a show that basically every single week is going to give you four really good recommendations to watch on Netflix. So what you can watch right at this very moment, it's a really cool show. I'm really excited about it also because I get to work on it with Adam Chitwood from Collider.com, who's incredible. And we have Haletta from Film HQ. She's hosting it. So it's been a really a really cool team and a lot of support around the office for this show and it, I think it's going to be something that you're going to have fun watching and it's going to be super useful you can catch the very first episode of that today 1 p.m. PST and also we have a brand new episode of Awesome Tackler that is on Verizon's Go 90 network we also have a playlist on our YouTube channel that you can check out that actually all anyone can see uh, and all the new episodes go up on go90.com and then the a week later those episodes drop on YouTube all right, uh, let's move on to mailbag. Gary Richardson writes, Hey Collider team, one of the things I keep hearing the panelists mention on Movie Talk when discussing movies is that a majority could have benefited from being shorter. Cut 15 minutes off that or 20 minutes off there and you have a tighter film and it would be better. To me at least it feels that movies have been slowly edging upward in movie length over the last few years. Now some such as Lord of the Rings trilogy I give a pass to. Even at three hours they were all well directed, scripted and acted movies that do not get boring. However, others feel bloated as if the studio or director wanted to hit the two hour, 20 or 30 minute runtime for some reason and shove scenes in that that add nothing to the story. So my question is, is the problem directors, studio interference or editing issues and should movies try to go for two hour max runtimes to make them tighter and leaner films to watch? Well, we kind of discussed this with the Transformers thing. I mean, it, it rarely is it the studio. Studios always want the movies shorter because that way they can right. play them more often. It's usually the director that wants them longer. And depending on the director's power influence, do they have final cuts? Or if they're just someone that's, you know, that has that kind of power that they can sway the, <coughs> the studio to do a longer film or convince them that it is needed. The one thing I would say is that, that some people, a lot of people don't realize that they always talk about like editing issues. It's like editors. They, they do what with what they get. Mm -hmm. So so a lot of times when people are like, oh, man, that, that movie could have been shorter or I didn't feel like this was done well, a lot of it has nothing to do with the editor. They, they get the footage. They, the directors tell them what to do, the producers. Not to say that the editors can't, you know, don't have skill and they can't do what uh, something to improve the film, but they, they don't have, in terms of length of time, they don't have that much influence mm -hmm. over. Uh, what do you guys think? Yeah, I mean, pretty pretty much what you said, just in terms of who's responsible for it. I mean, I think it's a little bit of everybody, and it also depends on the situation. You know, when certain people have final cut, that, that could come into play. But I think about this all the time, because, like I said before with Transformers, I really do want to be open and go into every single movie I see with the utmost positivity and hope for it. But I'm not going to lie. When I see a movie has particularly a two-and-a-half-hour-plus runtime... I tend to get a little nervous just because there's a lot there's a lot of movies out there that have really long run times that make it work. I jotted down a few, Titanic, Inglorious Bastards, Wolf of Wall Street, Zodiac, but those are all movies that I don't think has an ounce of fat on them and they all have great pacing, but it's not easy to pull that off and I definitely think that it's the minority of movies that justify a runtime like that. And I mean, we, we were talking about it with Wonder Woman because this this was one of my issues with Wonder Woman. It's it's pacing, and mm -hmm. there are a couple of moments in that movie. I'm just using it as an example because it's the most recent release where I think you could have taken out a couple minutes here or there. So I think it's just about the overall feeling and what's going to work because there's also instances where you have super short movies that feel like you're getting so much out of them. More that I jotted down. Stand by Me, What We Do in the Shadows, Lion King and Beauty and the Beast, the classics. Those are all under 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. Yet those feel like like full experiences where I understand all the characters, the stories. I get so much out of those movies. And then just like another fun thing to think about, an interesting thing to think about, I should say. When, when I was in film school and I was being taught about 
sending your films out to festivals, whether it's a short film or a feature, I was encouraged to limit the runtime because it makes it more programmable. So, mm. programmable? Is that a word? That's true. Yeah. 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 I think hey. it's a word. Yeah. You Take used diagenic earlier, didn't you? Yeah. 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 God, that's a, I had to look that up. <laughs> Bigly is a word. Programmable is yeah. a word. Listen, I... I agree with everything Perry just said. I mean, what, what can you add to Perry? Just run down, of course, another intelligent analysis. All I can say is, to me, it's case by case basis. Yeah. It's He's a case just by kissing case. my ass so he can get my Transformers plus one. Uh. Not true. You already promised it to me. You already promised it to me. <laughs> the, no, the, uh, it's a case by case basis. So you're right, and I agree with you on the Wonder Woman thing. There are some, there are moments in that film that could have been shortened or quickened, and I agree with that completely. Especially in the second, or the second half of the movie, I felt there were some moments, but. But that's like nitpicking, right? When it's really done well, like you said, uh, Titanic, uh, Ava even Avatar. I would throw mm -hmm. Avatar in there. People went to see that multiple times. When it's done well and it hits you in a certain way, people will go over and over mm -hmm. again. But you're right. It's a minority of filmmakers, directors, uh, producers, whatever, that can create a film that works in a long run time. But you got to also look. If you grab the public's attention, because we will binge watch four or five episodes of our favorite show in a night that's yeah. an hour long. So, like, what are you doing there? You're essentially watching a four or five hour movie. So you can do it. It's a matter of keeping the attention, making the story interesting, making the visuals interesting, and, and, and making sure that you stay in your seat watching it. So to me, that it's certainly possible. It's a minority of situations. I don't think anyone's to blame. It's just a matter of like, okay, it works. They're making deals. There's a lot of moving fa factors in this. I and Roka, and Roka you, you and me agree on uh, one of our favorite movies, Lawrence of Arabia. Lawrence of Arabia. Three and a half hours long. Mm -hmm. Three and a half hours long. I wouldn't cut anything. On I would that. add another half an hour if yeah. I could. Uh, yeah. It's that much enjoy. It's yeah. that enjoyable of a film. That'd be tough to do today. Um, I think that <laughs> if, you know most of those guys ain't around. Um, I would. You know what? I I just like I agree with Gary because it, it confounds me as a, as a movie fan. Mm. I just do not understand who is doing in in the world of comic book films. I understand why they're a little bit longer because not only are you telling a story, you also have some pressure, whether it's from yourself or the studio or the source material, to set up a new adventure within the context of this film. But I, there seems almost to be a stigma against big budget movies that have a lot of effects being under 90 minutes. Like if that happens, then you know you're getting a bad movie. And I don't think that should be the case. I think that an 80 movie, an 80 minute film could be awesome. And I think it could be big budget and have a lot of robots in it, and it could be 85 or 90 minutes, and it'd be great. But it's almost like if a Transformers movie came in at 90 minutes, people would be like, uh-oh, what's wrong with this movie? What's, <laughs> what's the problem with this movie? Why is this so much shorter? Do they just not have a good enough story to tell? Maybe they have a better story to tell. You t I, I don't like it because I have a tiny bladder. <laughs> All right, guys, let's move on to live tour questions. You can tweet us at Collider Video. Wendy, what do we got picked up? Well, first of all, John Forsyth, Forsyth says, I wonder in how many languages Roca can say gravitas. <laughs> <laughs> uh, awesome. Well done, Forsyth. That's a great question. <laughs> all right, for real, the first Twitter question comes from James Thomas Welsh, who writes, Unbreakable has a budget of $75 million and Split had a budget of $9 million. How much do you think the sequel will cost? Uh, a lot, because if you're going to have... Uh, Samuel L. Jackson. I mean, that's where for mm -hmm. Unbreakable, I, I, if I remember correctly, that movie didn't really have that much mm -hmm. visual effects or action to it. I think it mainly went to the salaries of, of Samuel L. Jackson and Bruce Willis. Did you even have like, a big like effects-driven train wreck, or was it just you saw it on the news afterwards? Or it was like... <sighs> Man, remember it being yeah. really I think close maybe flashbacks. Of it. Flashbacks. Yeah. Flashbacks. Yeah, yeah. flashbacks of it. But it, it wasn't the, like a whole... like. Yeah. Destruction, not like uh, like Super Eight or anything like that. Yeah. It was like I think just flashes. I think the it. good news for for Shyamalan and company now is that I think you can get Bruce Willis cheaper than you can get him in the early two thousands, yeah. and maybe the same can be said for Samuel L. Jackson. So you're gonna get to get them more on you know you're you're paying fifty cents on the dollar for those guys, <laughs> and I think that it is gonna come in at a lot less. I think that's good news. I don't think you need a big budget to tell the story. You certainly didn't need it with Split, which arguably could have been just as big of a story as Unbreakable. It seems like. Uh M. Night Shyamalan nowadays at least is working better with a limited budget mm. too also if he sticks with Blumhouse that would completely go against their typical practice of shooting great movies on a super low budget and they've made it work with big actors before where mm. they've made you know like a Purge movie with Ethan Hawke I'm, I'm assuming he gets a good deal of money and Lena Headey too but yeah. they made it work for, for a little bit and 
You know, yeah. the same. I guess the same thing with Split. I'm assuming James McAvoy and and you know Anya Taylor Joy's price is probably going up. So I'm sure they have their ways to make this work. And you know, Samuel Jackson and Bruce Willis are wealthy guys. It seems like Samuel Jackson in particular, just because I see him on social media more so than I do Bruce Willis. But it also seems like he is an especially passionate guy. So if he is super into the idea of doing more Unbreakable, I think he is going to cut them a break. Well, and also, I think they're going to do what you're talking about with Ethan Hawke and uh, Lena Headey, where mm. they didn't get paid that much, but they got points on, on mm. Uh, mm-hmm. The Purge, yeah. and I think they probably do that with like Bruce Willis and Samuel L. Jackson. Yeah, and also, if the studios see that he could make a good film like Split for $9 million, why would you give him 30 Like, you just go, okay, do it for 15 And plus, because he still has to earn back a little bit of the goodwill, I think, with studios. But I also think he might have that kind of cachet like Woody Allen has, where actors of name come and do it for limited budget because they know it's in service of something bigger, right? Mm-hmm. That they enjoy working with him. And so he may be one of these guys that still has credibility with a lot of actors, and especially after coming off a of Split. McAvoy was fantastic in that movie. He really gave him a lot of space to create these characters. Actors love nothing more than to get extra time on screen to show how incredibly talented they are. You know, So for me, if he gives that vibe off, actors will come at cut rates or lower rates than usual because they understand the budget walking in. And I, and I think he should stay smaller. I think he tells better smaller stories than when you start giving him the happening, you know what happens with that. <laughs> so like, you give him the smaller stuff, he really kicks ass. And so I, I, I hope the uh, studio comes in and gives him 15 maybe and makes it work for that. Mark? Uh, yeah, I you know I, I saw the Fifth Element for the first time. God, Bruce wow. Willis is good in that movie. Mm-hmm. I miss peak Bruce Willis. Oh yeah, Die Hard, Die Hard, Fifth Element. Yeah, it's uh, like after Die Hard with a Vengeance, that is still John McClane, and then Die Hard, Live Free or yeah, Die Hard comes yeah, yeah. out, and it's like you you no, shaved Br- your head and something happened. Mm. We need we need John McClane with a little bit of follicles, or else it just doesn't work. I don't. All right, what's next? <laughs> Ellis, did you say you just saw Fifth Element for the first time? First time. For the first time, yeah. When? I popped my uh, cherry. Got to meet Corbin Dallas for the first time. Oh, my God. Loved bless it. your heart. Loved it. Mm. It's such a good movie. All right, this one comes from I Do It All Day, who writes, <laughs> 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 Since Wonder Woman is already at $42 million worldwide, do the guys on the panel want to revise their opening weekend numbers? Yes. I yes. said over 100. Yeah. So I, see, I said like 80, 90, so mm. I, I will go over 100 now. I think... Now that all the reviews have come out, I already said that I liked it before, but mm-hmm. now all the positive reviews, and I know people always, it, it's its weird how people always complain and say reviews and critics are yeah. worthless mm-hmm. until yep. it's a movie they, they like and whatever. So uh, I think it's going to help it a lot, uh, and I think it's going to go over 100. In their defense, Dennis, I am worthless. I think I picked <laughs> 112 to 115 million opening weekend was my latest, and uh if I, I would love to up that to 120 million, but sorry, I find that to be cheating on the Friday after it already came out last night. So I'm sticking with 115 million dollars, but I hope you do better, Wonder Woman. Well, the question was, would you like to revise it? Yeah, not saying would you no, like to I, cheat. And I, can, and I consider that using PEDs. So I will oh. use the PEDs. <laughs> well, I'm happy. With, I'm check right now. 125. <laughs> I mean, I said over 100, but I think 125 oh, now. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I, th- I think, like I said before, the repeat viewings. People are gonna. I'm going again on Saturday already. And so the repeat viewings are going to make the money. I think women want to go see this film as much as possible because it's done so well. Families want to go. It's just it works all around, you know. And so I think it's going to have multiple, multiple viewings over the next few days. You know. I think I'm going with 105. Okay. What did you think have before? I, well, I think when we were talking about those stories where it was the, the long-range forecast, yeah. I mm. always thought it was going to be <laughs> well, closer to like low. 85, yeah. 90 mm-hmm. and higher. And then over the course of the last few days, I thought it was going to be even higher than that. And I definitely think it's going to cross 100. But, I mean, I'll just say it again. like Big-time credit for the people at Warner Brothers yeah. because that is how you lift an embargo. There is no doubt in my mind that critics in this scenario... Yeah gave that movie a significant boost, not just because the reviews are very positive, but because it was the smartest strategic move ever to lift the embargo the way they did, where it's like, like, oh, two, three weeks in advance, let's let people tell everybody on social and start you know, yep. getting all the hype. Because that is a thing that happens with social media, where when you're limited to 140 characters, you're likely going to stick to the things that you liked. So that happened. People got all excited. And then it's like, oh, let's lift the embargo early. And then all of a sudden, Monday night, I'll never forget this in my entire career, when that embargo lifted and YouTube was just flooded with reviews, flooded with positivity. And really, all anybody's been talking about the past few days is Wonder Woman. 
kudos to everybody at Warner Brothers. I think yeah. it was handled really well. I'm excited that the movie is tracking so well now. I agree. I've never seen people on Twitter pump their reviews up as much, like preface in the day. I, my review comes out at 7 p.m. tonight. Pay attention. Like I've, Snyder was, mo was most notorious of anyone oh, Jeff. pumping, yeah, Jeff <laughs> pumping his review of the film. So I think that speaks volumes. And I agree with you, Dennis. If you bitched about Rotten Tomatoes before, you don't get to praise it now. You don't get to say, well, they're against DC and see they can. No. Stay consistent. Stay consistent. If you're whining about it, you got to whine about it now. That's how it works. Don't give me this crap now that you all of a sudden change your tune because everybody likes Wonder Woman now. You're no. going to be such a good dad. <laughs> that's, right. that's right. All right, let's do two more. <laughs> okay, this one comes from Rob McDonald who writes, Last summer, Conjuring 2, Lights Out, and Don't Breathe were all big financial successes in the box office. What horror movie do you think will be a big financial success this summer? What's can coming? I, well, yeah. can I not say this summer? I mean, I. Well, the question I'm says the summer. All right, so I'm going to cheat. <laughs> I, I think it is just going to blow away that box office. I think that that is going to be not necessarily a surprise hit because I think there's already a lot of excitement oh, for that. But yeah, yeah it, it is. If that movie is good, it's going to crush the box office. But this summer, there's, there's really not, not many big very ones. many big ones. Uh, there's I, one. There's well, one. Well, there's, there's Annabelle. There's 47 oh. meters down. Oh, my God. Many more <laughs> sharks and stuff. Well, yeah. It comes that, at night, That is right? coming out. It comes well, at night? Yeah, but it, it comes at night is a limited A24 release. Oh. So it's if, not I, if I'm it's talking not about oh, big okay. money. Can but I consider The Dark Tower a horror Ish. I mean, it looks more like a Western from that yeah. first trailer, but there's definitely going to be horror elements. I don't know how well that movie's going to do, but I think it's probably going to be the highest grossing horror-ish movie of the summer that does not feature sharks. When, when does It come out? In it the comes out September. in September. Yeah. Oh, well, I, was, I think that movie's going to demolish. Even if you didn't like, because I didn't like Annabelle, just give Annabelle 2 a chance. Mm -hmm. Give it a chance. Agreed. I mean, this already came out, but I feel like Get Out is like the surprise hit. Like, mm. uh, no one expected that movie to do that it well. It is so good. So, Memorial Day mm. weekend, I watched that for the second time, like, because I had seen it when, it when it first came out and I thought it was great. I watched it a second time and a third time over Memorial Day weekend. Holy shit, if you have not seen that movie a second time, mm. it's, I, I think I want to say it's even better the second time, which is interesting when you know exactly what's going to happen and that makes a movie better. Well, there's an Amityville film coming out. I don't think that's going to blow up. But, Pretty sure that was pushed and pushed. Is Ghost Story considered a horror film? No. Nah. Is that more of no. an ex... Is that a treatise on a relationship? And, yeah, that's okay. not horror. All right, then, yeah, I would probably... Yeah, there's not going to be anything that's going to... Because uh, summer's not really the horror, you know, time. So I'd be surprised if anything besides... And if maybe... It, if, it, if it comes at night, blows up on the indie scene, they might do a, a larger release yeah. during yeah. deal. Maybe it'll be this year's shift. The Witch. Yeah, maybe. Mm -hmm. All right, all right, last one. Okay, this one comes from The Nightmare Before Christmas, who writes, is it true that Power Rangers, I'm only asking because Perry's on the panel, is it true <laughs> that Power Rangers being the best-selling toys now could help the sequel? Yes, yes. No, I think, it's, I think it's very true. <laughs> toys, toy sales, it's a pretty big deal. And I was reading through some of the reports. I mean, you shouldn't just go in and think, oh, you know, just because the Power Ranger movie came out, that's why the toy sales are so high. There's series and stuff. There's other reasons why the sales are so high. But, you know, Saban could say, I got all this money. Let's make another one. And I'll, I'll continue to repeat what I've said before is I think that Lionsgate also has a certain amount invested in this franchise right now where if they opt out of the sequel, it could do more harm than good. So even though Power Rangers did not, crush it at the box office like I was hoping and dreaming. Yeah. I, I really do think, a fan or not, I really do think there is a chance we could get the second one. And huh. also, wait, one re one really quick thing. There's also Wish Upon this summer. Oh, the yeah. one with Joey King. Well, does Alien Covenant count as a horror too? <coughs> yeah. It, it yes. doesn't count as a successful horror. Well. Unfortunately. <laughs> I'm going to see it tonight, I think. Uh, I, I think it depends. Does Lionsgate <laughs> get a cut of that? I mean, I, I heard before that Power Rangers merchandise already was selling, mm -hmm. you know, even without the movies, mm -hmm. but obviously the movie brought more attention to it. I wonder if Lionsgate gets a cut of that or only movie-related merchandise to Power Rangers. Maybe they get a cut. 
even they, they get a cut of that, and maybe that's enough for them to make another movie. I even don't. if that's yeah. the case, yeah. it'll it'll probably be a, a way lower budget, like twenty twenty five million, and you can get those actors back. That's for sure. They're not blowing up anywhere anytime soon. Mm-hmm. So if you want to do one, now's the time to green light it. I don't mean in a negative way. I mean it takes time. One of them just build. got cast in Aquaman. Yeah, but it credit. takes time to build. I'm not I'm not taking anything away. It takes time to build up credit. Is all I'm saying. And so get them now. Get them now and put them in and and make it make it happen. And I think 25, 20, 25 is fine for what because I think. This is what if they're gonna do a sequel, it's not gonna be no <coughs> high end no. sequel. It'll be a sequel like Amityville The Awakening or something. It'll be something that's a little smaller in terms of their approach. So here's uh, my question though: is like it, people love that TV show, and it didn't necessarily have the biggest budget during the TV show. So do you have to make a Power Rangers mm. movie with a huge budget with great effects, or do you, can you make it look like just? With worse effects, can yeah. you just spend less money on all the post production and all the the CGI and all that stuff because it will give you the feeling of you're watching the TV show? Yeah. With the you know the, there's up production values in a lot of other areas. Like I really like the Power Rangers movie, so I wouldn't mind seeing another flick in that universe. But if you're going with the same pay scale, then you can afford like one Ranger and a Krispy Kreme. Like that's <laughs> all you can get. So I want to see another Power Rangers movie. I just don't think it's gonna happen. All right. All right, Sorry. guys, uh, that's it for today's episode. I want to thank people joining us at the table today. Perry, where can people find you? I'm going to be buying all the Power Rangers toys, and you can also find me on Twitter and Instagram, at PNemroff. Again, don't forget to check out the new Netflix show. We also have a brand new Collider behind the scenes and bloopers tomorrow, and it's all about me and Wendy going to Disneyland to ride the new Guardians of the Galaxy ride, so you're going to want to check that out. Awesome. Roka. Uh, you guys can always find me at the Roka says on Twitter and on Instagram. I got a bunch of stuff out now. Outlaw Nation uh, episode five dropped yesterday with Jason Inman as my special guest. We talked Wonder Woman, DCEU, and, bun- and comic books, all that kind of stuff. And, of co- and today we dropped on the Cinephiles 1977 Star Wars: A New Hope. Steve and I talk about it with our uh, special friend Michael Vogel, who is one of the executives on the new My Little Pony movie. Uh, and coming soon, I've got a new venture that I'm going to launch in a little bit. So follow me on social media, and you hear about all that stuff. Mark? Uh, Dennis, you can get tickets to upcoming comedy shows at MarkEllsLive.com. I got some San Antonio dates, some Jacksonville dates. This weekend, I'm at the Comedy Store. Two sets tonight, two sets tomorrow night. In between sets tonight, it's either Alien Covenant for the first time or Wonder Woman again. What am I seeing? Uh, Never seen Alien Covenant. Love Wonder Woman. I don't know what. I, I, actually, I, I actually like the Alien Covenant. So. I kind of want to see Wonder Woman like opening weekend though. Okay, with, yeah, like, to, with the crowd. Yeah, sure, yeah. you can watch Alien Covenant later. Yeah. Okay. Well, you sure. might not be able to if it drops as much. Yeah. <laughs> Sharks. <laughs> All right, Wendy. Where can people find you? You can find me at uh, the Movie Couple channel. Sorry, I thought you were going to throw it in the touch <laughs> through me, y'all. Switching it up. All right, the Movie Couple channel on YouTube and at Wendy Lee Zaney on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. Natasha. You guys can find me accidentally hitting this desk with my foot <laughs> and on Twitter and Instagram at Natasha Lexus underscore. And you guys can find me on Twitter at Think Hero or Instagram Dennis.TZNG. Thanks to Adam and Cody in the back. Uh, and don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you guys can subscribe to this YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Collider Videos, and we'll see you guys next time. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.